today on Cook's Country, Christy makes Bridget the ultimate grilled thick cut porterhouse steaks. Adam reviews paring knives. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of crumbled blue cheese. And Lon makes Julia the best Caesar green beans. That's all right here on Cook's Country. The original American Steakhouse dates all the way back to the 1700s when taverns and large seaports held private dinners called beefsteak feasts. Now they were also known as feeds and they were an all men no frills eat with your hands event that focused on three things, eating beef, drinking ale and rubbing elbows. Now local butchers brought their juiciest steaks and chops to grease the wheels of fellowship and trade with visiting ship captains. By the late 19th century, the feasts included well-to-do merchants and politicians from the town. And after women got the right to vote in 1920, female patrons were finally admitted and the atmosphere was elevated with decor, cocktail menus and silverware. It was the beginning of the modern steakhouse. Well, today, Christy and I are creating our own beef steak feast out on the grill with the grandest steak of them all, the porterhouse. <music> There's steak, and then there's steak, and then there's the king of steaks. That's the porterhouse. Now, this costs a little bit, and it can be tricky to cook, but Christy is going to show us how to get it right on the first try. <laughs> we are going to make great steaks today, but you have to keep in mind that these are expensive steaks. Heck yeah. Each one of these is going to run you about $50. So I want to make sure they're done right. There you go. What we have here are actually two steaks on one bone. We've got the nice lean tenderloin on the one side and the more marbled strip steak on the other side. And these two steaks don't cook the same way. No, they don't. So that was our challenge, was to find a way to make them cook perfectly with a rosy interior and a crusty exterior on the grill in the same amount of time. Well, we're starting with two, two and a half to three pound porterhouse steaks. And you'll notice they're about two inches thick. And yes. that thickness is really important to making sure that they cook evenly. Okay. Now we always talk about how fat equals flavor, mm -hmm. but too much fat can cause flame ups on the grill. These look great. You only want to have about a quarter inch of fat along the outside. Okay. So I'm going to start out by just patting these dry. Now we're gonna season these and I'm using kosher salt. It's easier to see and distribute evenly. A teaspoon of salt on each side of each steak. So these look good. I'm yes, gonna... they do. <laughs> I'm gonna transfer these to a pretty large plate and we'll let these chill in the fridge anywhere from an hour to 24 hours. Bridget, I got the grill heated up while we were waiting. Okay. I started by opening the vents all the way on the bottom, and then I lit a full chimney of charcoal briquettes. That's six quarts. Okay. I knew that the briquettes were hot enough when they were partially covered with ash okay. on the top. And then I poured them into an even layer on half of the grill. Then I put my grate on, covered it, opened the vents, and now I just let it heat for about five minutes. Okay. Now I want to get the grill oiled, so dip some paper towels in a little oil. So before we put them on the grill, I'm gonna pat them dry because they won't start to brown until they're dry. And so. where we salted them inside and let them sit with the salt on them, that salt pulls up a little bit of that moisture to the surface, so you're just really getting rid of that. Right. So I'm gonna add about a half teaspoon of pepper to both sides of each steak. Okay. In order to get the, the really great sear, we needed to use really intense heat. The problem is we have two very different steaks connected by the same bone. Mm -hmm. Place them directly over the heat. So they are over those coals. They're directly over the coals, but this is the tenderloin, mm -hmm. and this is facing the cool side. Strip steak could handle the heat, mm -hmm. but the tenderloin is so lean. You've got the strip steaks facing the hotter side of the grill, but that leaner filet, it's facing the cooler side. And what are we going to be facing? How long are we waiting here? <laughs> Six to eight minutes. With the lid off, we're just going to look for a really nice brown sear on the bottom. Oh, I'm going to be looking. <laughs> Smells amazing it out does. here. And I took a little peek. Okay. And I think we're ready to flip. All right. We need to flip these so that the tenderloin is still oriented the same way. So I'm kind of going to go tip to tail rather than side to side. All right. If you oh. get any flare ups, you just move your steak over to the other side of the grill for a minute or so until it subsides. Don't mm. spray water on it. Look at that crust. Those are things of beauty. So how long are we going to have to wait on the second side? Just another six to eight minutes. All right. I can do that. You can. Are they done yet? Are we there yet? Are they done yet? <laughs> <laughs> if I have to come over there. <laughs> so I'm just going to flip these because you can see that we've got a really nice crust on both sides. Beautiful. So now I'm going to move them over to the cool side because we want to cook them the rest of the way 
over indirect heat. All right. Yes. And I like the way that you face the bone towards the hotter side. Yes, it's acting like a heat shield, kind of. And that's just going to help deflect a little bit of the heat so that the steaks can cook gently over on this side. So now I'm going to leave the lid on for this last phase. We're going to let this go four to six minutes, flip the steaks, and then another four to six minutes. Gives me plenty of time to go sharpen those steak knives. <laughs> You've been so patient, Bridget. <laughs> but I think it's time to check. They look great. <laughs> yes, they look they great. Do. And we can't just tempt them anywhere. We found the best, most reliable place to check it was about three inches from the tip of the strip steak. Now I'm looking for a temp between 115 and 120. 117. 117. Yep. Now that temperature might seem a little low. But the thing is that these are big steaks and they're going to continue to cook once we take them off the heat. After about 10 minutes of resting, they're going to hit 125. Perfect medium rare. And we're going to be feasting here in how many minutes? 10 minutes. All right, 10 minutes. So I'm just going to cover them, tent them lightly with foil, keep them warm in that time. Yes, yes. <laughs> Longest 10 minutes of my life, I have to say. Well, you're about to be rewarded. <laughs> These look so good. I mean, come on. Look, look at this. Before she talks in there, that is an insanely gorgeous steak. And we're going to serve it so that it looks kind of like this. OK. But first, we have to take the meat off the bone. Yes, we do. So I'm just using a bony knife here so I can carve right near the bone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to kind of wiggle around to find the shape of it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's the same color from the center to the exterior. That was the strip, so now I'll just carve the tenderloin off the other side. So I'm gonna leave my bone, Okay. keep that, and we'll go about slicing the beef. I just wanna cut this pretty thin. Oh my goodness. Like butter, it's slicing like butter. No. I'm just gonna kinda of tuck the meat back in along the bone. That's well, stunning. And now we'll carve the Tenderloin. Cannot forget that guy. <laughs> but look at the color of the tenderloin as well. They both hit medium rare. They both look like butter. <laughs> now, we could eat this right now. Oh, yes, we could. I mean, we are going to eat it right now, but a little melted butter. So I'm adding a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt to the butter. Heck We're just yeah. going to drizzle this all over. And now we just want to season a little bit. All right. There's a lot of meat here. Kosher salt, a little pepper. OK. Can you hand me a plate? Oh, yes, I will gladly work that way. <laughs> so here is the strip. And tenderloin. And there is your very, very tender tenderloin. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. There's the same color. Same color from edge to edge. Beautiful. <laughs> Juicy is not even close to what the slices of steak are. I mean, mm -hmm. and it tastes super beefy with that salting method that you used. Really enhance the flavor. Right. You know, I love that method of keeping the tenderloin away from the fire, kind of shielding it mm -hmm. a little bit. It's not overcooked at all. <laughs> Christy, a steak is medium rare, but well done to you. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> well, you dropped some serious coin on these steaks, the good old porterhouse, so it pays to know how to grill them the right way. Season two inch thick steaks with kosher salt and refrigerate. Grill the steaks directly over the fire with the tenderloin facing the cooler side of the grill until charred on both sides. Finish the steaks over the cooler side, keeping the bone facing the hotter side, and let it rest. Then carve, slice, and rearrange the meat around the center bone. Finally, drizzle with seasoned melted butter. These are worth every penny. So from Cook's Country and the Meat Eaters Club, the best thick-cut porterhouse steaks that you can ever make. A paring knife has a short, flexible blade, which is perfect for certain tasks like peeling, poking, pitting, and even paring. And today, Adam's going to tell us which paring knife is a cut above the rest. It may be small of stature, but it's important in the kitchen, Julia. It because is. Because you're right. These have the smallest, most agile blades in the knife block. We tested eight different models. The blades are all three to four inches long because in the past, testers have determined that that's the optimal blade length. The price range was a low of $8.76 to a high of $49.95. Not bad. Now, we had a brigade of testers. There were men, there were women, there were novices, there were experts, people with different hand sizes and knife skills. And they used all the knives to slice small blocks of cheddar cheese, 
to peel and slice pieces of ginger, mm. to peel, quarter, and core apples, to section and peel oranges, and to hull strawberries. Now they were looking for a couple of different things, obviously sharpness, and they tested that by holding a piece of paper up, mm -hmm. slicing through, both at the beginning and the end of the testing to see whether it retained sharpness. They were also looking for handle comfort. A lot of times, whatever you're working with, you're holding up. You don't have the stability of a cutting board, and I would love for you to demonstrate that for us. There's a Victorinox knife right All there. Right. Why don't you try peeling the apple? All right. Right, you're hold I'm holding it up. I would never do this. Exactly. So holding it up in the air, this knife is pretty good. Testers were looking for the handles to almost disappear into their hands so that the blade was like an extension of it. Mm -hmm. Now there is a concept in ergonomics called affordance. And what that means really is a simplicity of design that will make a handle comfortable for lots of different hand sizes, lots of different grip positions. And testers felt like that knife had it. That knife with the larger handle is the Shun, and I want you to give that one a try. All right. Oh, huh. The handle, it's thick on this side and thin over here. It feels like it's making my hand slip towards the blade, so I'm having to grasp it even harder. That is exactly what the testers said. Now, a lot of times when you're working with a paring knife, you're using just the tip of the blade, so it's got to be sharp from stem to stern. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to core a tomato with the white one over there. That's the Dexter Russell. Oh, geez. <laughs> Oh wow, I feel like my hand is far away from my thumb and it's not going through the tomato so well. That's exactly the case. The testers really felt like the tip wasn't sharp enough on that. Now, there are a couple of other aspects of the blade that testers look for. One is flexibility. Mm -hmm. Do you want a little bit of blade flex to get around those curves? They were also looking for the thickness of the spine. Now, I'll show you. This one has a very thin spine. Mm -hmm. This one has a somewhat thicker spine. 1.5 millimeters versus 1.2 millimeters. Wow. And testers really found that when they were working with the knife that had the thicker spine, it felt duller because they were dragging more metal through mm -hmm. whatever it was that they were peeling. Yeah, it makes it less agile. Right. So in the end, this was the knife of choice. This is the Victorinox Swiss Army Fibrox three and a quarter inch spear point <laughs> pairing knife, $9.47. One of the testers even commented that she thought this knife made her knife skills Ooh. better. That's not bad for a knife that costs less than 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. More money doesn't buy you a better pairing knife. Instead, go for the Victorinox Swiss Army Fibrox Pro three and a quarter inch spear point pairing knife at just $9.47. When you hear blue cheese, do you think of Cabrales, Stilton, Gorgonzola? What about prepackaged crumbled blue cheese at the supermarket? Well, are they any good? Jack's here, I hope, with the answer. And I'm going to change your mind because I have a feeling you are prejudiced against these crumbles. Yes, I am. I like blue cheese. Blue cheese. EU. Not necessarily U-E. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> these are actually labeled blue crumbles. Okay. Blue which crumbles. is not that really encouraging. <laughs> But it tastes better than it reads. Okay. So why don't you dig in? All right. A couple things that we learned are winning cheeses are actually made with raw milk. And you know enough about cheese that I know you know that raw milk cheeses are always better than pasteurized milk cheeses. Always. Pasteurization where they heat the milk up, yes, it kills bacteria, but also kills flavor. And so when a cheese is aged long enough, over 60 days, it can be made with raw milk. Our top two cheeses were made with raw milk, the bottom three with pasteurized milk. So that was the first thing we learned. Second thing is the amount of blueness, mm -hmm. um, if you can call it that, really varied quite a lot. And that depends on the amount of oxygen the cheese gets during the aging process. They can either get oxygen in there by making the cheese less dense and more porous, or they can actually put holes in it to get oxygen deep into the cheese. And the more oxygen, the more bacteria, and the more blue you get. And this is a big range between, it could be feta, um, yeah. in one case, to that's a lot of blue. <laughs> <laughs> one of the big differences here is what they are tossed with to keep them from sticking together. Ooh. So they're crumbled, and they're moist, and they're sticky. So there are two choices, potato starch mm. or mm -hmm. cellulose. And the cellulose gives a bit of a powdery dryness to it that even carried over where we made dressing, where we melted them on crostini, sure. and even in the dressing, we felt like the ones that were tossed with the cellulose were a little dry. Mm -hmm. And our top two choices, again, besides being made with raw milk, they were both tossed with potato starch. So anything you're noticing as we start tasting? Some very distinct blue cheese here. I mean, really strong, a little bit peppery, teetering towards Cabrales or something like that. Absolutely my favorite. I would think that you would take a piece 
a really good blue cheese and crumble it yourself and you put that in there. And I'm pretty sure that's what you did. I think I changed your mind. Hmm. This one, definitely tangy, but then so are socks that you don't wash <laughs> after a week. All right, this I is... mean, I've heard that. I don't know that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Although the more I eat it, the better it gets. So I'd say one, two, three. All right, you want to start? With the winner? We'll start with the winner. You chose the Roth Buttermilk Blue Crumble. Okay. Studio audience favorite, expert panel favorite. We thought like it had a good amount of blue flavor, nice texture. It did not seem like it came from the supermarket already no, crumbled. It no. tasted like really good blue cheese. And it's really balanced too. Yeah. And let's go with my runner up. So this is Stella. Huh. This was in the sort of the bottom Stella. of the rankings. Stella. <laughs> um, our tasters generally thought it didn't have enough of the blueness to mm -hmm. it. I mean, it has tanginess, but it wasn't really blue enough yes. for many of our tastings. It tastes almost yogurty, if that's a real word. We'll <laughs> go with that. <laughs> And? And this was the boys' oh. head. Tasting panel thought this was actually really blue. Mm -hmm. And many people thought there was too much going mm. on on this one. It landed in second place. It's a good cheese. But it felt like it wasn't as balanced as our mm. one from Roth. You definitely changed my mind. I mean, these two are great. Even this one, it's got that little bit of tang that I, I think I might like. I'm not quite sure. Good job. All and, right. I, and I changed your mind. You sure did. Really great pre-crumble blue cheese. Well, it's out there. You should go out and pick yourself up some. Our winner is Roth Buttermilk Blue Crumbles, and they run $3.99 for four ounces. Caesar dressing is all thanks to one man, Caesar Cardini, who was a restaurateur in the early 1900s, and he owned restaurants both in California and in Mexico. And as rumor has it, he just whipped the dressing up one night for friends, and it became an instant hit. In fact, in 1953, the International Society of Epicures declared it the greatest recipe to originate from the Americas in 50 years. And it is still as popular as ever today, and people use it to dress up all manner of things beyond mere lettuce leaves, including green beans. This dressing is kind of magical. <laughs> it's got so many really big, bold flavors, and yet it manages to heighten the flavor of the green beans instead of masking it. It's a beautiful salad. Um, it starts with the green beans. I'm starting with one and a half pounds of green beans, and I'm just going to trim the rest of them. OK, um, now are you a two-sided trimmer? Oh, you are. I just trim the one side, because I like the little pointy ends. I have to say, I trim both sides, but it's because I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I can just cut off one end, flip them around, neaten up the edges, and then cut off the other. That's and right. I don't have to pick through them. It's pretty great. So let's get these in the bowl and start cooking. All right. I have four quarts of boiling water, and I'm adding one and a half teaspoons of salt. We want to make sure they're seasoned. Mm -hmm. Just going to add these beans. We're going to make sure the water is at a full boil, give it five, maybe seven minutes, and then we'll have a look and make sure they're done. In the meantime, let's get the croutons going. Ooh, one of the, my favorite parts of Caesar salad are the croutons. So here I have three ounces of a really nice baguette. It's been cut up into half-inch pieces, and I'm just going to add two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil and season it up with a quarter teaspoon of pepper. And I'm not seeing any salt here, and I'm guessing that's because the dressing is gonna be salty enough for everything. You got it. So just a quick stir to make sure they're nicely coated, and let's toast them up. I'm going to use medium-high heat, and it's going to take about five to seven minutes. I just wanna stir them occasionally, but not constantly, to make sure that they have some time to brown. Julia, it's been about seven minutes. Let's have a peek. They look nice and a bright green. I'm just going to taste this guy. It's, um, it's nice and pliable, which is a good sign. But I heard a little bit of crunch, which yeah. is what you want. You don't want them all the way soft and throw. They're pretty perfect. Let's get these out of the water. Okay, dope. Don't these look great? They do. Nice, bright green, still steaming hot. Right? Now, if I had been at the restaurant, I would have dunked these into an ice bath, but I never actually have enough ice for a proper one. So instead, I'm going to spread them out on this towel-lined rimmed baking sheet. The towel will wick water away from the beans, which means that our salad won't be soggy. And in the meantime, there's plenty of space for these to cool off. So our croutons look great. I'm going to make sure they're nice and toasty. I better test it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. let's get them back into that bowl we used earlier. Time to make the dressing. I've got three anchovy fillets here, and I'm just going to run a knife through them. They're the key to this dressing and the key to this salad tasting amazing. I want to make sure that they're really minced. This looks pretty great. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to scoop up these anchovies and they'll go into this bowl with one and a half tablespoons of lemon juice. Next up, I have a tablespoon of Dijon mustard, one tablespoon of Worcestershire. These are all very potent ingredients. Right. Three cloves of garlic that have been minced, half a teaspoon of black pepper, last up a quarter teaspoon of salt. I'm going to whisk and you'll notice there's no egg in this dressing. I did notice that because a classic Caesar dressing usually starts with a raw egg or a raw egg yolk. That classic dressing is also really thick and really creamy and it sort of coats everything. Mm -hmm. And I want the green beans to kind of come through. So this is going to be a little lighter, looser dressing. Oh, nice. This dressing, however, does have the extra virgin olive oil. I've got three tablespoons and I'm just going to whisk as I drizzle it in. This looks great. Mm. Going to add this to our bowl of croutons and then our green beans. Last element, the cheese. I have Parmesan here and I'm going to use about two ounces of Parmesan, but instead of grating the cheese, I'm going to shave it. I like these shards. They have a beautiful shape that complements the long slender beans. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use about one ounce into the green beans right now. If I were to add it all now and toss it, I would break up some of those beautiful mm -hmm. shards. But I do want to make sure some of that cheese gets a nice coating. Um, it's two ounces of cheese for this salad. One right now, one on top. And this sounds great, right? You can hear the texture in the bowl, the clinking of the croutons. Right. And more cheese for the top. A little garnish. Right. A little well, cheese halo on top. I mean, not a little. <laughs> Right, you can't have too much parm. That's my style right there. Gorgeous. I mean, this really elevates green beans from Tuesday night status. Yeah. You ready to try this? Of course. Doesn't that look good? I love how the dressing doesn't have any yolks. Yeah. It's more of a vinaigrette. The green beans taste sweeter because of that savory dressing. You get all those flavors without mm -hmm. that heavy, heavy texture. And you're right, the green beans taste sweeter because of it. And I know the croutons are good because I've already tried it, but now with the dressing. <laughs> They're still nice and crisp, tiny mm -hmm. bit of chew to them. Perfect. To make these company-worthy green beans, start by giving the beans a quick boil in salted water, then drain them and spread them out over a towel-lined baking sheet to cool. Whisk the dressing together by hand using potent ingredients, including anchovies, Dijon, and raw garlic. Finally, garnish the salad with shaved Parmesan and homemade croutons. From Cook's Country, an easy but show-stopping recipe for Caesar green bean salad. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>